what does it take to grow a site to 1.8 million organic visitors per month? In this episode, we're going to find out as we're joined by Steve Toth, founder of SEO Notebook and former in-house SEO at FreshBooks. We're going to geek out and talk about some pretty advanced things such as content depth and what it takes to rank, using multiple link building vendors to grow faster, future Google algorithm updates, and automating your work as an SEO. So tune in, this is going to be a good one. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the Authority Hacker Podcast. How's it going today? I'm doing well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, glad to have you here, and I'm particularly interested to to get your take on on the industry because you've also been in this game a while. Is it 12 years that you've been doing SEO for? Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, since 2010. Uh, and you've worked in house for FreshBooks. Um, I, I believe you got them to around 1.8 million organic per month, which is very impressive. You've also worked with uh, dozens of clients as well, and I wanted to ask you, where do you see most site owners go wrong when it comes to, to SEO? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on the experience level of the site owner, but you know, obviously people make mistakes about going after really high volume keywords when uh, they you know, don't have the, the site authority or really the depth of content that they need to be able to rank for that kind of stuff. Um, I also see people depending on tools way too much. Um, you know, if you think about everybody using the exact same tools, everybody's getting the exact same keywords, everybody's producing the exact same content. So there's, um, you know, I think some mistakes made there. Um, for me, I like to really start with Google as my main keyword research tool. I think, you know, there are a lot of SEOs who, who start there as well, but I don't think enough people do. Sorry, you're not a fan of using Ahrefs or SEMrush or, or anything? Um, I, use, I definitely use Ahrefs uh, for um, research. It's not the place that I start for content production, to be honest. Um, I'll always use the Google Auto Suggest. People also ask related uh, searches, um, stuff like that, you know, really studying the SERPs um, to help me with my initial strategy. And then if I want to round out keywords, like if I want to find every keyword with a specific match in it, then, you know, maybe I'll use Keyword Explorer. But in terms of like what I personally do, um, I don't I don't start with keyword research tools. I start with Google. But you know, Ahrefs obviously hugely valuable for things like looking at top pages, organic keywords of other sites, backlink profiles, um, PPC bidding. Like it's it's it definitely has its uses for me. But it's not a place that I start when I'm producing a content strategy. You mentioned something interesting. You said the they lack the depth of content. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think, you know, this goes back to like this whole like topical authority hot issue from 2021. Um, you know, I, I think that has always been the case, to be honest. You know, I, um, I once in my early career, um, you know, had a client that was a criminal law firm and we wrote content for like, is it a crime to do all of these different things? And, you know, they ended up ranking for pretty much like, is it a crime to do like everything? And then they started ranking for all their other criminal defense keywords that they, that they you know, were targeting, right? So I think Google has always had this sort of like, like some kind of like bar in terms of, you know, your content doing well. Like, first of all, you have to have that depth of content then once that content starts to rank, then you gain the external benefit from that. Have you noticed in recent years uh, a kind of consolidation of uh, structuring of content and and basically everyone's saying the same thing? I, I, I've certainly felt that with search intent and kind of how it works, the first page of Google in many keywords, especially competitive ones, you have 10 results and they all are structured virtually identically, same length, cover all the same points. Um, what's your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, tools like Surfer and Phrase, like they have really strong use cases, obviously, like they're very successful and lots of people use them. Um, the only thing that you would run into is that um, if you were Google and all you had to choose from were results that say the exact same thing, 
is that a good user experience for the searcher, right? Like the searcher is going to want to open a few different tabs and, and not just read the same information over and over again. So I think the, the way that I approach it is like use tools like Surfer and Phrase to um, come up with like those topics that you need to cover, but then also go the extra mile and, and try and, um, you know, include information that's not right that's not on that um on those other other pages and like even like offering your own commentary uh is hugely valuable as well and that's something that i've done for years like going back like i would say like seven or eight years when i really caught on to that before tools like surfer and phrase um but i think uh, you know if you're working with a writer and you know maybe you can't expect them to have their own specific commentary on an article that they're just like learning the topic but you can do things like have them research pdfs or powerpoint presentations with site operators and find um, you know additional content that not everybody else is researching and then incorporate that into the content so do you typically train your writers to to do that or do you do that for them and kind of like show them how to do it yeah we show them how to do it and um, basically um, d we don't we don't just have them stop at um you know what the what those tools are using right um come up with an interesting hook at the beginning um go the extra mile with your research actually read the other articles that are ranking and see what kind of additional value you can add even if that's like you know info that you're finding on a youtube video for example right youtube's a great way for a writer who doesn't know a topic to really get well versed in it very quickly and I don't think enough people use YouTube for for research um, as they should. Why do you think YouTube's so so strong? Um, I, I kind of had the suspicion that because the the amount of effort it takes to create a video is significantly higher than uh, a blog post, that people tend to put more effort into to making it good. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of merit to that. Um, you know, oftentimes, like if there's um, complicated subject matter, um, having that um, distilled in a video form, <coughs> excuse me, um, having that distilled in video is going to communicate um, that particular sort of niche, you know, whether it's like something scientific or something like, you know, with regards to like, I don't know, engineering or something like that. Um, you know, explaining these things in a simple way through video is going to be a lot more effective than um, reading like a white paper or a, a scientific study on something. So, um, you know, people often to get their message out, um, go to YouTube and, and create these types of videos. And th these are, you know, really in, important ways to relay are very effective ways to relay complicated subject matter, I think. I've found a lot recently with reviews and trying to figure out if a product is good or bad uh, you know it's not not always the case that you can do all the tests or you know have the product in hand uh, when you're when you're writing a review but i found that using reddit uh, and just looking for people's opinions there you tend to tend to find very honest sometimes brutally honest opinions there versus if you're just looking at youtube or sometimes uh blog you know other people's reviews or blog posts they tend to be affiliates so they're all you know quite favorable as well yeah i mean there's also the the challenge that you run into like it takes time to sort through a youtube video or find the right one and stuff like that so you obviously have to be kind of like careful but you can use things like view counts and fortunately youtube doesn't show thumbs down anymore but you can kind of get a sense of um you know what what are popular videos with lots of comments and also read those comments as well not just the video but the comments can also be extremely useful and yeah places like reddit and quora um are, are excellent places to go for those honest opinions yeah and my number one tip for uh for doing research on youtube videos is get the uh chrome plugin video speed controller and then just put it on like 1.5 everyone's voice sounds super high pitched but uh you get through it much much faster as well oh yeah for sure yeah that's yeah that's a no-brainer uh, so I, I've run my own sites, I've taught SEO, I've even worked with clients before, but I've never been an in-house SEO. And I've always wondered, what is that like? I mean, you must have many additional challenges to, to deal with there in terms of like the, the politics of it all and, 
getting resources to, to kind of align with, with your view. Can you tell us a little bit about what, it, what it's like to be an in-house SEO? Yeah, for sure. There's, um, especially in a SaaS company, there's lots of pressure because the um, success is very cut and dry, right? Like we can tell how many trials we generated, how many of those trials upgraded, and you know the data scientists are there telling you how you did every month, right? Um, and uh, and there that does add a lot of pressure because it's not even you who's reporting; it's somebody else who's reporting on your success. And um, actually, I uh, had a boss. His name is Chris Cisco, and he's actually an Authority Hacker member. And he was uh, super excited to hear that I was going on the podcast today. And he was my director at FreshBooks, and he was awesome. I mean, without him, we probably wouldn't have achieved what we achieved. Um, he shielded us from all the BS um, from you know other departments wanting to like check an SEO box and unwilling to change an H1 be like, I want SEO on this page, but oh, I can't touch the H1. Sorry. Um, like he, he totally shielded us from, from that type of uh, stuff and those types of requests. And he took a lot of like the, the requests from outside the organization and just handled them or outside of our department and handled them himself. Right. So when he left, um, he left at the same time that I did in uh, March, 2020, but I actually continued on as a consultant for FreshBooks after I left as an employee and he was no longer there. And I noticed a huge difference in, in how we um, you know, operated. And would you, do you think people tend to start as an in-house SEO and move towards doing their, their, their own thing? Is that, that feel like quite a natural transition, the one that, that you've gone through? Yeah, I mean, there's other people um, in in my space, like uh, personally, like somebody who's not really officially mentored me, but I would consider him still a mentor, like casually, is Eli Schwartz. And um, he spent a lot of time at SurveyMonkey uh, before um, becoming a SEO consultant. And he has that book, Product-Led SEO, and is very, very successful as well. So um, I think it's a very popular path because you get that exposure um, to the corporate world, you make tons of contacts. Um, people can associate you with a brand that they know, so they feel good about hiring you for their brand. So, I mean, if anybody does have that kind of SEO consultant aspirations, like I would say um, going to a company and obviously doing a great job is going to help you. And um, yeah, it's, it's just been amazing for me. I've been really blessed uh, to have that opportunity. and obviously to do well with it. It's probably good to get exposure to like the other side of the fence as well. Imagine like, you know, if you're working with lots of different writers or, you know, link vendors or whatever, whatever else you get to see uh, kind of how they all perform and, and, and the best of what, what some of these companies have to offer. Yeah, um, that was a, another like um, really huge blessing for me working at FreshBooks was, um, you know, being able to control a budget, right? can't say the exact um, number of the budget, but I remember when Chris came to me and told me what the budget was, I was like, cool, per year? He's like, no, no, per month. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's awesome. And, um, and, uh, and he was, uh, you know, really supportive of the types of things we wanted to do. And um, at the time when I started working there, um, we had an agency and they made some really awful recommendations. It was like literally my first week in the job, they had re recommended to redirect 50 pages um, for our invoice templates cluster into one page. And I was like, why are we doing this? Like we would potentially want to rank for Microsoft Word invoice template. Why are we collapsing this page? And like, this didn't make any sense. And it completely tanked our main invoice templates page, which was the money page of all money pages on that site. And, um, you know, that was a recommendation straight from the agency. And uh, it took a little bit of time to get rid of them. But um, because like they had sort of come in through a recommendation of the vice president of marketing. But we, when we let them go, we took their budget and um, spread that across probably over 20 different vendors in during the year of 2019. And um, that was like such an amazing experience for me because I got to meet so many awesome people, right? So like, um, you know, I remember I hired Glenn Alsop to do an audit for FreshBooks. <clears throat> um, after in 2020, I believe we started working with, or maybe late 2019, 
uh, we started working with Kyle Roof and like, um, you know, I got to learn from like all these amazing SEOs and, uh, you know, obviously up to my own skill level in game by just being exposed to people like that. Awesome. Um, so can we dig into maybe some of the tactics that you, you used during that growth uh, period? Like when you started at FreshBooks, can you give us an idea of, of what the traffic was? Um, uh, and then I think you said that it was peak went up to about 1.8 million. Yeah, um, I look at it per month. So um, our traffic was probably in the neighborhood of like 9,000 or so, like with the blog. Um, so we had not really had any like um, SEO. We didn't have like a specific um, SEO section of our website, if you want to call it that. Um, but in uh, 2018, we began to plan um, for um, two major initiatives. So um, the first major initiatives was uh, reversing those redirect decisions and, uh, and creating 110 pages for invoice templates. So main page invoice templates and then things like invoice templates for contractors, for graphic designers, for freelance writers, for all these different professions. And uh, we launched those pages in January 2019. And by that summer, we were ranking number one for invoice template, which um, had a search volume of 300,000 per month. Um, so it was a huge page for us. And like all the rest of those, like 110 pages that went with it um, also did very well. And some of the specific tactics, you know, around uh, that were this was um, right around the time in late 2018, where um, Kyle uh, won that contest for rhinoplasty plano where he ranked a page in Latin and he was using tools like Pop and Quora. And I remember looking at that rhinoplasty plano page and like studying it like inside and out. And this was prior to hiring Kyle, but I modeled our invoice templates page after rhinoplasty plano. And I, and I did the same with all of the other pages that we did. And I remember like, you know, my VP of marketing, this is a guy who like worked at eBay and Square and stuff like that. Like I showed him this Latin page ranking and he like couldn't believe it. He thought it was the most hilarious thing. And then I told him like our page is going to be like basically like this, but in English and he thought it was awesome. So um, that was one of the, um, you know, main uh, strategies there was first of all, like a huge cluster of keywords uh, and pages for these invoice templates, but then using a tool like Quora to really um, C O R A uh, S E O tool lab.com um, to uh, really optimize these pages to the nth degree. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, when we launched those pages, they started to do really well. The first thing we did was um, improve the conversion rate. Conversion rate doubled without even um, having the rankings change. So we already got like attention from the rest of the company that we were doing well. And then they just started, you know, to, to really support us as those pages increased. And you mentioned there that you, you started ranking for the keyword invoice template. So was that essentially like a, a, a category page where you, you had all the other invoice template for designer invoice template for whoever else uh, linked to from there? Or was the invoice template just like a, a post in itself? Like what, what was the structure there? Yeah, it was a landing page. Um, so we had all of the um, main um, higher volume uh, pages like um, contractor or uh, graphic designer who, or we also had file types like invoice template, PDF, Word, Google Docs. So we linked our um, main secondary money pages from the, the parent page and then down the line uh, we also had like smaller pages like sole proprietor or artist and things that had a little bit less um, less demand but were still worth doing okay and you know in terms of link building for that what were you what were you doing if, if anything yeah so um, we definitely did a lot of link building um, one of the things that like actually I would recommend to like anybody whether you're in-house or you own your own site or you're at an agency and you use different link building vendors is to not be pot committed with one like use multiple and also like if you find that the quality is diminishing from the vendors you're using don't be afraid to like keep hopping from link builder to link builder because they're all going to have their own like separate inventories and strategies for doing things and 
naturally they're going to get, they're going to exhaust, you know, their, their best strategies and they're going to exhaust their list. So um, having lots of different relationships like that is really important. And, you know, when I was working there and spending that budget and, and getting introduced to all these different people, selfishly, I was making relationships that helped my consulting business um, when I left, right? So um, that was huge. Uh, one of the, uh, like we did do some like more strategic link building as well while we were at FreshBooks. So uh, one of the strategies that I identified was, um, you know, FreshBooks is a company that at the time was about, in business about 15 years and um, we're a part of lots of lists for like invoice software accounting software like best accounting software best invoicing software and um, we basically like scoured the web for all the mentions of fresh books and these types of listicle pages and we came up with something like four or five hundred articles over the course of 15 years that were written and uh, we, we noticed that um, lots of these articles um, had you know very like old old articles like 10 years old and you know some of these um, articles had like 50 backlinks 100 backlinks going into them because they were so old so we knew that getting a link from them would be you know powerful for our invoice templates page so we basically outreached to them and said hey thanks for linking to and featuring fresh books on this we actually have like a free alternative for for people who you know need to invoice would you mind like mentioning that as well and most of them because of the brand i think the brand affinity uh were, and the fact that they already linked to us we're happy to do it yeah that's interesting uh, I, I see a lot of people when they're doing link building they, they get that one link from someone they stick it in their success sheet and then they never talk to them again and never ask for for anything else but like you said especially if you have a strong brand we, we've really felt this recently with authority hacker when we're doing uh, outreach in this industry where some people at least have, have heard of us uh, that asking for for links or asking for a second link or a third link or to do some other type of collaboration not not even necessarily link building uh, but some other cross promotion um, it, people are just very open open to it so I think it's a it's a good good approach um, did you have any issues or challenges especially working with so many different vendors on link quality and what were your kind of expectations or, or standards or was there any links that you you said no to yeah so we really hired the best um you know the best that we could find and set very clear expectations from the beginning um we also like you know built a lot so there are definitely challenges where you know you have like 50 links coming in per month or even like more than that sometimes um, that you have to do quality control of. So definitely there were cases where we'd have to say like, this is kind of crap and like, please don't do this or like, don't, you know, but in terms of like the vendors that we selected, you know, they weren't going to use exact match anchors. They weren't going to make classic mistakes like that. So we were, we were fortunate to be able to a find those people and then have them work you know collaboratively with us on that and how do you decide who is a good vendor in advance of working with them i mean are you doing any kind of research on them or looking for reviews or is it just a case of trying them out and and kind of see how it goes to be perfectly honest how much they charge <laughs> like are they are they trying to like scrape like are they like a bottom feeder and you know trying to sell like everybody like $120 links like no I'm not interested in that especially when you're spending a budget for um, you know a, a brand it actually like some people like when you're when you have like a large budget you don't want you know you want to like feel that you're buying something that you know is is good right and like that can translate to anything in your life like you know you don't want to buy it when you're considering buying a a coffee maker like if it's too cheap you're like well this is probably going to break it's not going to be good quality but you're like if you're buying like a four hundred dollar coffee maker you'd be like this is going to be good like i feel good about this so so there you have it if you're a link building agency watching this just increase your prices and you'll get you'll get better customers because people will will think you're you're better uh I, I like and, that. and and hey if you're making more money you probably have a little bit more um time to improve, do a good job improve yeah. your quality yeah uh, amazing. Okay, so is there anything else uh, around the the kind of growth trajectory of of FreshBooks that you think is worth worth mentioning from the the point of view 
of uh, like a, an affiliate or an authority site owner that they, they might want to want to hear about. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, that 60,000 visitors, 1.8 million a month, uh, 60,000 a day um, didn't didn't come from the invoice templates pages specifically. And if you run a content site and you, um, you know, have uh, ad revenue, then you definitely kind of maybe want to listen to this one, this strategy. So um, just the background was my boss came to me and said, hey, Steve, um, like we need like a thousand articles. And then he just like walked away. So he just, he just kind of like, was like, yeah, we need a thousand articles. And I was like, okay, well, where do I start? Like, you know, I'm, that's a hell of a lot of articles. Right. Um, and, uh, and you know, I just kind of took it back and thought about it for a while. And, uh, and the strategy that I came up with was using the people also ask around, you know, topics like invoicing, accounting, entrepreneurship, taxes and whatnot. So we mined like thousands of, um, of people also ask questions. And, you know, I, this was in uh, late 2018. And, um, you know, we didn't have the tools that we have today, like keyword Q, like I say this, like, you know, it's like an ancient time, but SEO has evolved in, and, you know, we're actually really lucky now to have tool keyword clustering tools like Keyword Cupid. Um, and uh, there's some others, but that's the one that I use personally. Um, to cluster all these these topics together. So at the time, like we were just wrangling like massive spreadsheets of like thousands of people also asking, grouping them together. And we ended up um, writing 650 articles. And the way that we did that was uh, actually by hiring five writers and um, having them come into the building for three months. And each of them wrote probably two to three articles a day. And, uh, and um, you know, that, that was how we, uh, how we um, produced all that content. And, um, you know, at the time, like, I remember wondering, like, do I use the exact people also ask title or do I try to modify this? Like, you know, it was basically like main PAA that had like the highest search volume if that was available. And then like three, two to three related PAAs for the, the different headings and jump links for each of those, right? So that was the, the structure of all those pages. And, um, you know, they start, and we also released them all in one month. So we didn't wait to drip them all out. Like we basically took like a month and a half to upload everything. And then we just hit publish all like within the same month. Um, and by about a year, um, the traffic had, you know, gone up to, I would say like by maybe like 40,000 in a year. And, uh, and then uh, at our peak, just for those pages in particular, uh, it was about 50,000 um, and just in just a little bit over a year. Wow. Is that 50,000 a day? Yes. Ah, that's really good, actually. Uh, and can you give us an idea of like the return on investment for fresh books for an exercise like that? I mean, I'm guessing it's quite expensive to, uh, to hire five full-time writers, you know, to come into your office, but what kind of return was that making for you guys? Yeah, good, good point. Um, so we looked at it as like a way to build our email list. Uh, that was our, our main um, KPI. And then we also ended up earning like a shit ton of links um, from from that as well. So I think we actually did count up the number of links that we got just from that um, section, which was called the resource hub, which is freshbooks.com slash hub. And, uh, and we actually returned like if we um, averaged out like the cost per like I know like you know how links go it's like all DR based even though that it shouldn't be but anyway we kind of averaged um, the, what the cost was of all the links that we got and it was actually much more than the investment and uh, how has your your thinking or your understanding or your approach to SEO changed since you've moved on from from fresh books yeah good question um, so I think the the way I kind of characterized my own evolution post fresh books was like in my first year of consulting it was like fancy spreadsheets and then um, my second year it was really automation so um, one of the um, best tools that I have ever like one of the best investments in my business I think I've made to date um, was getting a bare metal server and running instances of Windows 10 on that server. And um, I work with a Python developer 
and basically, you know, she just kind of like comes up with, or she writes the scripts that I come up with and, um, and put installs them on the server. And, you know, I can just run that server in the background, you know, as long as I kind of want, right. I would just tell her, Hey, you know, please like familiarize yourself with, um, the Google search console API, the NLP API or whatever we needed to use for a particular script, uh, browser automation as well. Um, and, uh, and then tell her kind of what to do. She just goes in on the server, installs everything. And then I can basically run that in the background and, di and because it's windows 10 server, I can just disconnect and, and it still keeps running. So can you give me uh, maybe an example of like a, a script you've built or some, something that you've achieved using that then? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, I gotta be careful yeah. to be honest <laughs> about, about what I, what I, um, divulge, but, um, I've used, um, like content, um, planning, uh, scripts, um, to, to basically like, I had a technique where, um, like if you Google, let's say you Google car insurance and you get like Geico and Allstate and whatever, you get all these different like brands. So you, you, first of all, you Google car insurance. And then you get, let's say, Geico and Allstate as number one and number two. Then you um, search those two websites with a site operator for car insurance. So I'm searching site colon geico.com car insurance. And then I'm getting all the different like car insurance related topics from them that are helping them rank for, for car insurance. So like using a, a data for SEO SERP API to do all that stuff automatically. And then, um, you know, expanding upon that um uh you know further with um just like clustering uh those different topics together and uh kind of going um doing a couple other things i won't mention but um you know that's an example um, another one is like the search console api um that you can basically like you know download um all the keywords the page is ranking for um and uh and kind of work that content back into your, your pages where do you see the future of, of automation like this in, in a search engine optimizer's job? Uh, I think it's just like hugely, imp like it's just such a time saver, right? Um, like you, you, you have to be creative enough to come up with these ideas, first of all, right? So anything that you kind of, like actually if people are, um, read SEO Notebook, which is my email uh, list that emails a piece of strategy every week, um, a lot of those techniques I've automated, right? I don't really talk about it too much, but, um, you know, if you have, you know, different things that you do that are repeatable, um, you know, browser automation, I'll just throw it out there that if you can click on something and do a repeatable task, then you can automate that in your browser, right? I won't go into too much detail on like what you can actually do. I'll leave that to your imagination, but um, you, you can basically uh, um, save so much time and scale so much easier with stuff like that. And where do you see, I mean, you've been doing SEO for what, 12 years or something now. Uh, I'm guessing you've seen a lot of Google algorithm changes. Where do you see it going in the next few years in the future? Well, we're already at the point where there's content for literally every topic. You know, obviously there's going to be things that are emerging. Um, I'm just starting to play with um, that tool, Exploding Topics, uh, by Brian Dean. It's actually pretty cool. Um, I think I'm I think I'm going to get the 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 pro license and and also mess around with the API a little bit. But in terms of like stuff that's more standard, like all of your like typical review type of content or um, you know, just about anything under the sun. Um, all that stuff has been written before. So you're going to run into challenges if you're going to try and break into that kind of thing. Um, you need uh, like commitment to like um, achieving that topical authority over time. Um, you also shouldn't bite off more than you can chew um, with working on too many sites at once, I think. Uh, because if if you if you're spread too thin or if you delegate tasks to somebody who doesn't have like if you try to delegate your strategy to somebody who doesn't have enough experience they're probably not going to do as good a job of you um, so basically my my advice is um, you know make sure that when you start a project 
you know exactly what it is that you will need to do to be successful don't make that a guessing game while you're doing it like have a plan and then realistically seeing see if you could commit to following through on that and if you can't don't take on too much at once do you think in situations like that there's going to be this kind of budget arms race where bigger companies who are, are coming in you know buying up uh, the whole SERPs essentially of, of sites, guys like Red Ventures in, in the credit card space or there's a, there's a few others out there can just kind of outspend you constantly and, 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 and beat you. Do you think that's going to be like a, a theme over the next decade or so? Yeah, I mean, like those, um, you know, Glenn Alsop had that article about like the 16 companies that control uh, Google, like, um, you know, they're, they're they're wise right like they they understand how to uh, how to build empires right so um definitely like be being careful about um you know where you enter um but you know what like it, i won't say that it's impossible um i work with a site um in the crypto space they 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 have a wallet basically that helps you convert your uh, crypto to fiat and like actually spend it on a credit card and whatnot and, um, you know, that site is less than a year old and we're ranking like number three for like best Ethereum wallet right now. Um, a bunch of Ethereum uh, pages and also Tether and like some of the other ones are starting to come up as well. And like that site is a year old, right? Um, so, you know, I won't say that it's like impossible to break in, but you got to know like the commitment that it will take. And, you know, there's only so many people with the experience out there that can quickly kind of assess the viability of a project. And it's just all about the follow through. I think there's so many SEOs that know exactly what to do, but very, but much fewer who have the ability to do it. So essentially what you're saying is it's becoming more and more a game of execution and who, who's, who's good at actually getting things done. Project management. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And I also want to ask you about crypto in the, or SEO in the crypto space. Uh, not something I've ever, ever touched on. I have this vision in my head that it's kind of the wild west out there that's similar to, you know, CBD or online casinos and in, in terms of the, the stuff people are doing, what, what's your experience been on the ground in, in that industry? Uh, I actually worked, uh, ba based on your interview, uh, with Stacy McNaught, I worked with her on a project oh, um, nice. for for my for one of my crypto clients, and uh, we did that image reverse image uh, link building strategy, and um, I I like I, you know it was good I would say like it didn't yield like the huge like n a huge number of links, but it correlated well with the site's performance right so um, that when when we started ranking initially for like Tether um uh keywords like it it was it was awesome because the site was like five six months old and we're we've got our product on page one you know highly relevant um actually number one with the featured snippet for things like tether wallet um but uh you know it really just like the it's not i wouldn't say it's that much different like i'm sure that there's lots of people using like pbns i didn't use a pbn for this site we just, um, you know, we did uh, homepage links, niche edits, and net new guest blogs. And I think if you're doing those three things, you're probably gonna have success uh, with link building. If you think about just the natural progression of a site becoming popular, those things would typically happen. So, um, you know, in strong content writing, um, strong outlines, um, good topical authority for um, that space um, things like glossaries um, would would def I thought I thought helped a lot um, you know buying crypto in specific countries guides and stuff like that um, that that also uh, did well and then um, obviously like wallet pages uh, we're doing some stuff on like the different use cases for crypto so basically you know just trying to cover these like evergreen topics that we have in the niche and then also some emerging topics as well. Um, I'm still picking up like a, a number of times you mentioned it today about um, you said, for example, how to buy crypto in X country. Um, and, you know, that that becomes a cluster when you, you repeat that for every country. Um, we've we have uh, a lot of success from our sites recently by finding those those clusters where you, you can 
create like a, a type of content and then just repeat it for, for every country or for every type of product or your use case or, 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 or something like that. Um, is that a strategy that you kind of use a lot then? Yeah, I mean, that's the one where I cut my teeth at FreshBooks doing that for invoice template. And that's actually in my consulting practice, the exact type of project that I want to work on. I'm, I'm lucky enough that um, I get, you know, enough leads from kind of my link, my newsletter, and then also LinkedIn, that um, I'm able to basically choose the clients that I work with. And, you know, I, I look for those specific types of like, I call it verticalizing content, um, where, where you can apply that to all these different verticals. And then, you know, you've got the the, the money page that interlinks to um, those secondary pages and those secondary pages link to each other. And, you know, they're all well optimized and you build links into sort of, I build my links into the, into the money page um, and then have that all filter down. But I'm also very careful about the type of links that I build. Um, and, uh, and you know, I think it's pretty much a very easy recipe for success. And one of the best ways that you can identify, um, those topics is by putting in your keyword, the word for like F O R, and then seeing what the auto completes are going to be for, for that. So you can go through the alphabet, like A, B, C, D, E, and see what, what those different auto completes are. And even if they have zero search volume, it doesn't really phase me. Um, Google is still actively driving people into those searches, right? So um, I, I really don't pay too much attention to search volume if something is an auto suggest, and it's a great way to identify those those opportunities. Yeah, for sure. So zero search vol volume can yeah. often be a, a benefit because all the other people using the, the the tool think that there's no point in writing about it. So the competition paradoxically can can be a little bit less sometimes, at least. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, so you mentioned a few SEOs, like guys like uh, Brian, um, Brian Dean, uh, Glenn Alsop, Viper Chill. Um, who else do you follow and who else do you think our, our listeners can, can, can learn from as well? You know, like in terms of like people who produce content, um, I don't actually follow that many people these days. Um, you know, it's more like people that I know to some degree or like I'm like, you know, somewhat friendly with. I still have like, I have tons of respect for Matt Diggity. I think he's, you know, done so much for the industry, especially the affiliate industry um, with, with his stuff. And he still shares valuable knowledge. Like in my note last week, I, I featured something that he like quietly dropped on a Facebook thread. Um, so, you know, Matt, um, Kyle, uh, Glenn, I have tons of respect for. Um, there's also like somebody I work with, uh, he's not, he doesn't really produce a lot of content, but his name is Capillo Chani. Uh, we partner in a few projects. He's amazing. Um, but you know, um, like Stephen Kang from SEO signals labs, an interesting guy. Um, he often, you know, shares a lot of valuable knowledge, um, in SEO signals lab and another group that he has. Um, but in terms of like reading, like watching videos, like I don't really do too much of that these days, to be honest. It's hard to keep up. There's just there's so much content out there. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to consume. Well, I'm also all. making my own content yeah. too, right? So um, like I'm just, I, I, my inspiration for SEO Notebook comes on a weekly basis. I never plan um, what I'm going to do weeks in advance. Like I kind of have like a running list or like a list of different f uh, saved things on my Facebook, but half the time it's just like I'm, doing something in my job and I have inspiration and it's actually much easier for me to write about it. And, you know, like I do a lot more like self-directed learning, right? Learning through observation. Um, there's actually one guy as well, his name is Jason Dolman, um, who's like a really smart guy. Um, I, you know, friendly with him. We, we do like a Zoom every once in a while, um, you know, and he's somebody who like, he's got, you know, lists of like, hundreds of sites that he just watches and learns from and that has also inspired me to to do the same thing and you know hrefs is my go-to tool for competitor research and analysis to see what's working for other sites and i also do a lot of learning from that yeah i think that's a it's a brilliant uh sort of idea as well is is that to have a list of uh sites that just do things particularly well and just just kind of keep an eye on what they're doing and often 
there there isn't really that much true innovation in in SEO. It's just people taking good ideas from a site that does something kind of like that in a different industry and then applying it in a slightly different way to to your own. And that's that's really how a lot of the the innovative, if you want to call it that way, I, ideas that I've seen um, come come about at least. Yeah, like for example, I was um, I was researching um, just like some of the featured snippets that I was ranking for with a client. And I was looking at some of the other sites that were doing well and they're like little lead in, right? So one of the site's lead ins were uh, for the, they had the featured snippet was some of the best Ethereum wallets are. And I just loved how like simple and cut and dry that lead, that H2 before the list was. So for one of my other clients, I we were doing like software reviews and I said, like, some of the best project management systems are as my H2. Like, so I'm taking it from one industry and applying it to another. Uh, okay, so is there anything that I haven't asked you that I, that I should have asked you? Um, well, I mean, selfishly, like, uh, I have other projects that I would like to promote. But um, the main one uh, is SEO Notebook. Um, so I started SEO Notebook in um, June of 2019. And I publish once per week, haven't missed a week so far. So it's like over well over 100 notes uh, by now. But basically, you know, it's one piece of strategy every week. It's either my own strategy or um, somebody else's where I'm giving them credit. Um, and, uh, you know, just publish for free, uh, once a week and we have, uh, 11,000 people on the list now. So it's grown completely organically and has really been an awesome thing for me. And then, um, the other, uh, project that, um, I'm working on right now is a WordPress plugin that uses Google search console data to optimize your content. And it's called gscore.io. Uh, it's currently on wait list right now. Um, just beta testing with a small group of users. I'm not rushing it out by any means, just kind of want to get it right. And, you know, it's not really like uh, my main source of income is still consulting. So it's more of just like a like a project that I'm like really, really passionate about. And basically what the plugin does is it connects um, directly to Search Console. It will pull um, the keywords that the page is ranking for. It will check to see which keywords are included in the content and which keywords are not included. And you can also isolate things like long tail keywords and question based keywords. So any keywords that start with things like who, what, where, when, why, is, can, does, um, and just basically find questions that people are finding, people that you're showing impressions for, and then just quickly being able to include those into your content. And then as well, um, long tail keywords. So you can just choose like, I want to look at keywords that are showing impressions that have six or more words that should be pretty easy to rank for. It'll quickly show you those on a list, and then you can just incorporate them directly in WordPress. And it, you know, you mentioned you do consulting as well. Uh, what type of clients are you looking for? If anyone is interested in working with you, um, I typically work with SaaS clients, um, and uh, yeah, I, I like those types of projects that have like large content buildouts. So um, I prefer to work with a site that is at least has like a lot of opportunity and like a large runway with it versus like a an old site that you know has like you know pretty much all their bases covered and it's just looking to do well i'm i like to build things so um yeah my my main um, clients are uh, b2b SaaS. i would say 80 percent and then 20 percent b2c um, but yeah always looking to sort of um you know work i actually like i have i'm now like uh, involved with um, three separate crypto uh, sites and I uh, really enjoy that. So if anybody has a crypto site that they want to kind of take to the next level, they can get in touch. Great. And they just go to seonotebook.com and click on the, the work with me link and get in touch there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. So um, uh, by the way, if anyone does have any questions for, for Steve, then when we publish this podcast on YouTube, you can go and put a comment there and if I can ask you, maybe just after it's published, go have a look and uh, and and maybe answer some questions there. Um, that'd be that'd be cool. Otherwise, um, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks for another episode of the show.